great pleasure that uh, we welcome Danny Murphy, uh, who is an honorary fellow, uh, Education, Teaching and Leadership at uh, Morrie House School of Education in Edinburgh. Um, just a few little biographical notes to share with you. In the past, he uh, was a volunteer education advisor in Cambodia. Uh, he has also been a secondary school head teacher uh, in a variety of places, including locally here at Creef, at Creef High School, also at McLaren High School and Lawrence Hill Academy. Uh, he's also uh, spent uh, a fair proportion of his life working in the university sector uh, in research, professional development and educational policy development. He has uh, made significant contributions to the practice and theory of school leadership as the founder director of the Centre for Educational Leadership at the University of Edinburgh. He's uh, been a member on many national education committees in Scotland, particularly to do with curriculum uh, and leadership policy. And he has an extensive track record in leading and facilitating professional development. He's going to speak to us today about the values of Scottish comprehensive education, and he's agreed to take a few questions afterwards. So we welcome Danny Murphy. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us today. Well, thanks very much, Ewan and Seamus, for the invitation to speak to this conference this afternoon. It's both an honour and a privilege for me to be here, and I'm very grateful for it. I thoroughly enjoyed the morning session. I particularly enjoyed it as a retired person, uh, <laughs> not having to deal with the, the, the many hassles that you face. And indeed, I want to make it very clear up front that I am not here to tell you anything about how to do your jobs. In fact, I never did think it was the job of anybody standing on a stage like this to tell professional people how to do their jobs. One of the defining characteristics of professionalism, I believe, is making the judgments appropriate to your situation. And nobody else can do that except for yourselves. There can be general advice, there can be new insights and ideas for you to think about and take account of, and maybe I'll give you one or two of those today. But at the end of the day, each immediate school situation is different. That doesn't mean that each of you is right in what you think, is always right in what you think. And one of the special things about a school community is the discussion and debate that takes place and has to take place between the teachers, between the teachers and the students, between the teachers, the students and the parents. And that special community atmosphere in which the different interests, the different values are resolved and satisfied within a school community is the topic of my talk to you today. Um, I, although I did a lot of jobs in my career, as you, as you pointed out, you and I can't believe I entered teaching in 1974, and it doesn't seem like a long time ago, believe it or not. Um, but although I did a lot of jobs, I was frustrated very often by feeling, particularly in my first headship here in Creef, where I really loved the school and the pupils, and uh, I felt I was trying to do the best job I could. And yet the tenor of the times and the policy of the times was very, very frustrating, and I couldn't get my hand on what, why I was so unable to find the words for what I felt was wrong. And that's one of the reasons why I did go into the university sector initially in the year 2000 to, to set up the qualification for head teachers at the University of Edinburgh. And then after I retired in 2010, I was invited back to do some teaching on that qualification. And it gave me a chance to put some of what I, some of what I thought were, I'd learned in the previous 30 odd years into words. And so I published a couple of books recently on the theme of comprehensive schooling and the Scottish model in particular. And uh, I'm very grateful for the chance to share a little bit of that with you today. Um, and I hope you find it interesting and valuable. It's not going to short sort your problems. The problems you face are very real. And they're true at school level, but they're also true at the policy level in Scotland. Um, but I hope that I'll give you a broader, longer term context, the context for my 40 odd years in the system, trying to realise the ideals of comprehensive schooling, which I think are still very important ideals for us to hold to in our secondary schools. So, first of all, I'm going to say a very brief word about the policy context, then a bit about the long term, maybe skate over that a wee bit. Um, 
Then I'm going to speak about the relationship between our educational values and our general democratic values in our democratic society in Scotland. And I feel it's important to elucidate that a little bit to understand the longer term problems that we have. We keep seem to returning to the same kind of issues, the same kind of frantic gap between policy intention at national level and the reality in our individual schools. And lastly, because Seamus did ask me to look to the future a little bit, I'm going to make a suggestion for something I think could help to resolve some of those tensions, but not as an imposed top-down initiative uh, with little preparation and insufficient piloting, as we heard evidence of uh, this morning from the recent introduction of National Fours and National Fives, but more something to think about for the future as a way in which we can resolve what I see as the fundamental tension that faces us in our comprehensive schooling system. So if you're interested, you can read more about what I've had to say today in that book. There's flyers at the back on the table if you're interested. And also in that book, which we published, I and a number of colleagues published in 2015, where we reviewed the first 50 years, 1965 to 2015, of comprehensive schooling in Scotland. It's a book I really wanted to get out when I retired because I felt nobody was looking at what a fantastic achievement our comprehensive schools have been. Uh, despite all the pressures and the tensions and the ups and downs of those 50 years, we have achieved some great things in Scotland in our comprehensive school system. And I felt it needed to be marked. And I was lucky enough to work with a number of colleagues at the University of Edinburgh to produce that book that charts through those 50 years the ups and downs, what we've learned, what we've achieved, what we've still to do. So there's a set of references, sorry, I'll just flick through all that. Um, there's a set of references on the slides. I think the slides are downloadable if people want them, uh, which are the backup really to the, the talk I'm giving. So if you're interested, you can follow that up later. Um, so I'm going to say just a few words at the beginning about the policy context, uh, because I do feel it's important to put that into, into the play. But you've heard enough already this morning about the detail of the problems that we're having in Scottish education at the moment. And part of that, I think, is an understandable desire on the part of politicians to do things and to sort things. That's why we elect them. We want them to sort things. We want them to do things for us. They have the power they can set the policy tone, and they can provide resources. And so that leads, on their part, I think, to an overweening assumption that they can actually do things, and there's actually a lot of things they just can't do. They tell us they can do them, they promise they'll do them, but they just can't do them. And some of these are local, national things in Scotland, but some of them are international things. Um, you know, we've got all these international forces in our world today, and national politicians struggle to deal with them. You know, we have globalisation of the economy, we have international terrorism, we have malware now affecting the international internet. Um, we have the rapid changes in technology that some people would argue are actually changing our young people's brains. You know, when you see a two-year-old going up to a big TV screen and trying to move the things on the screen, you know, you realise that they're growing up in such a different world to the, the world that... Well, I'm looking around, a lot of you are a lot younger than me, but certainly the world I grew up in. Um, so that broad context of things that national politicians can't change, but at the same time a desire to change, leads to a lot of frenetic activity and new initiatives, new policies, new fixes. This is what we're going to do. Nobody's going to get elected in politics by saying, you know what, guys, this is a really, really difficult job. And... I don't think we can do the things you're asking us to do. Nobody's going to get elected saying that, and it's we who elect them. So we also set the tone for the politics that we get, fortunately or unfortunately. And of course, the more you try to do, the less you achieve. And we heard that this morning with the kind of frenetic character of policy initiatives. I also think we're victims of poor design because of that, because if we don't acknowledge what the problems are, how can we design proper solutions? And Curriculum for Excellence is now 13 years old. It was 2004 was the first Curriculum for Excellence policy paper, which was just a very brief paper saying, you know what, it would be quite good if we took a broad view of education and not a narrow view. 
And here we are 13 years later, and in my view, you know, I write about this in, in the books, I think the design of curriculum for excellence for secondary schools was a bit of a disaster, really, because we've got broad general education and then we've got senior phase, and the two have got completely different educational philosophies. And it's like a car crash where they meet. And it's no surprise, therefore, we've got a 1 plus 2 plus 3 and a 2 plus 2 plus 2 and a 3 plus 3 and a, all the rest of it that you talked about this morning. But I do think it's important to think about the longer term and not just about the short term problems you face. I know that's difficult for you guys because you're going back into your schools and that's all you're facing, these short term problems. We heard a lot of that this morning. But I'm not trying to address that today. I'm trying to address where we sit in the longer term. Since selection was abolished and since we established the very stable and secure institutional arrangements for secondary schooling in Scotland, by and large, six-year area-based comprehensive schools. The introduction of parental choice kind of shifted that a bit, but still, by and large, that is the system for all our state secondary schools in Scotland, and it's given us a great deal of stability. And in uh, this book, we chart a lot of the achievements of those 50 years in terms of the statistics and in terms of other things as well, because statistics of course, don't tell the whole story. It is worth noting, though, uh, uh, something coming from the OECD report in 2015 that wasn't mentioned this morning, that that report mentioned that Scotland has more resilient students, and they or secondary school students, and they define resilient students as being students from poor and disadvantaged backgrounds who nevertheless succeed in their secondary school more resilient students than the average in the OECD countries. And also, Scotland has more socially inclusive secondary schools than most OECD countries. And these are two great achievements that aren't marked on the closing the gap agenda or that kind of narrative. And I suppose I want to give you a kind of counter narrative today, because when we were evaluating wanted to evaluate the 50 years, you know, what have we achieved, what have we not achieved, what do we still want to do? That's the purpose of that book. We were asking ourselves, how can we evaluate what comprehensive school, and we didn't want to just do it on the basis of statistics. So what we actually did was go back to what I see as the kind of foundational values of democratic living, because our comprehensive schools, secondary schools, are based on those values, and those values appear all the time in the problems we face, the issues we face, the challenges and successes of our lives in secondary schools in Scotland. And we can trace these values right the way back. I mean, you can see them in the parish school, you know, back a way, way back in Scotland. We can see them in the Advisory Council report of 1947, which actually set up the Scottish comprehensive school model, uh, talking about the, omni the desirability of the omnibus school and the desirability of young people coming together in one school. And we can see it in the work of the um, Scottish philosopher of education, John McMurray, and you'll forgive me if I just read a little quote from McMurray, because this is from his 1958 Murray House Lecture, long before comprehensive schools were introduced. The first priority in education, McMurray said, is by education we mean learning to be a human being, is learning to live in relationships with other people. Let's call it learning to live in a community. I call this the first priority because failure in this is a fundamental failure which cannot be compensated for by success in other fields because our ability to enter fully into personal relations with others is the measure of our humanity. The greatest threat to education in our society is that gradually we're falling victims to the illusion that all problems can be solved by proper organisation. 1958, that if we fail it's because we are doing the job in the wrong way and that all that's needed is more know-how. To think this in education is to pervert education. Education is not an engineering job. Education is personal and human. We see it in Circular 600 which introduced comprehensive schooling. The Secretary of State, Willie Ross, who wrote that circular to education authorities said Young people will greatly benefit in their personal and social development by spending the formative years of adolescence 
in schools where the pupils represent a fuller cross-section of the community, that the whole community should come together in our secondary schools. And we see it in the four adjectives and four nouns. I really like that interchange. Who was it said? Interchangeable adjectives and nouns, you know, effective citizens and successful individuals. And, you know, you can pairn them any way you want. They mean the same thing. Um, of our Curriculum for Excellence, which outlines a broader approach to what our education should be about. So when we were trying to evaluate, as I say, we wanted to evaluate um, on the basis of something bigger than just um, what the statistics told us. Because our secondary schooling isn't just about the statistics. The statistics are important. Children's attainment is important. Uh, you all spend your lives trying to improve children's attainment. And so did I when I was a teacher. But underpinning, it's like the tectonic plates, if you like, underneath what's on the surface. Underpinning what's going on in our schools is what our democracy is about, what we as people are about in our community, with our different interests, our different values, the th different things that motivate us. And so we went back to this 18th century designation because people are very familiar with it and it's very much true of what democracy should be about. We looked at fraternity, we wanted to try and find another word, but if you take the gender bit out of fraternity, um, it actually covers something quite important. And we added in this other word, equity, uh, as an additional important value for schooling. So I want to just quickly go over these because equality um, is a word that's getting a lot of airtime just now, but it's actually quite a complex concept. So we divided equality into four elements. First of all, equality of opportunity, which is quite a weak element, really. It just says everybody gets the same opportunity. It doesn't matter whether you're able to take advantage of it or not, but you get the same opportunity. Then the next equality, which is the very strong equality that uh, we're now talking about, is equality of outcome. That everybody should get to the same point, that doesn't matter what the other 83% of your life has been, but the 17% that you're in a secondary school, your teachers will get you to the same outcome. Now, that seems to be an entirely unrealistic uh, kind of equality. Because actually the opposite of inequality, or sorry, the positive side of inequality is diversity. We actually really value diversity in our society. We value the fact that people have different talents, different abilities, different ways of looking at the world. Diversity is a positive thing. So inequality is spin always negative, but people choose different things and inevitably we have inequality is something that we actually value in some cases. So we then thought about equality of input. And actually there's no equality of input in our society, is there? We talked, somebody talked this morning about uh, hiring private tutors. There's a great report that I've given in the references by a woman called Abigail McKnight at London School of Economics where she uses an American term to talk about the glass floor that's put in place by advantaged parents to make sure that their children don't fail. No matter what it takes, National 4, National 5, yeah, we'll get you a private tutor, hire, we'll get you to speak to our friend who's professor of medicine at such and such a school because they can give you more advice on how to get into medicine. We'll send you away to a summer school in France to boost your French so that your French speaking is, you know, We'll, we'll, when you're a postgraduate student, we'll read over your master's degree dissertation for you and point out a few things to help you out. You know, all the way through, we'll, we'll pay the deposit on your first home. All the way through their lives, children of certain advantaged families receive advantage. In a way, why should they not? Uh, there is enormous inequality of input in our society because we value that other great democratic value, liberty. We value the freedom of people and individuals to do what they want, and to do what they want with their money if they've got it, and with their social and networking advantages if they've got it. And all of us as teachers who are parents, we've given additional inputs to our own children. Why wouldn't we? You know? So equality of, equality of, expecting a quality of outcome when you don't have a quality of input is, I think, uh, you know, just doesn't make sense. The, the last equality, however, we thought was very important, and that was equality of value. And I'm going to come back to that near the end of my talk. 
So the second great um, democratic value is liberty and freedom. We've talked about that already. And we love freedom. We love giving people freedom. And people in our society greatly value the freedoms of democracy. And the very few societies that have tried to impose equality, because you can't get equality other than by restricting people's liberty, uh, they haven't succeeded in that anyway. As we know in Stalin's Russia, some people were more equal than others. And you just need to read Animal Farm again if you've forgotten that particular lesson. So we need liberty just as much as we need equality uh, if we're truly a democracy. And uh, that does mean the freedom for some people to employ competitive advantages in the competition that is school qualifications, in the competition that is university qualifications, and in the competition that is trying to get well-paid jobs, even if you wanted that kind of job in the first place. Fraternity is also a very important part of schooling. Fraternity is about face-to-face -face relationships. It's about affection. It's about caring about another person. It's about empathy for the other person. It's a kind of familial value which you apply outside your family. You treat everyone as your brother or sister because you empathy, but for chance it could be you. That's the value of fraternity. And without fraternity, equality and liberty are actually quite meaningless because you don't have any relationships. You may have equal salary, you may have freedom to do what you want, but if you don't have any good relationships, what's your life worth? It's not much of a democratic life if you don't have good relationships. So that trinity of uh, fundamental democratic values, I think, are fundamental to education as well. And we need to get back to talking about education and not just talking about qualifications. Qualifications are an important part of education, but people then go off and do different things. They forget about their qualifications. They do things they love doing, some of them, if they're lucky enough. In schools, we see the three of these in interaction with each other all the time, from something as simple as, do we have a school uniform or not? You know that? puts everybody on equal footing when they come in the doors in the morning? Uh, or do we, as our society likes, offer individuals the liberty to dress however they want? And what are the implications of that? That's liberty and equality, right, in tandem with each other, competing with each other. Do we give equal resources to youngsters that need more support? Or do we give them additional resources? You know, there's, again, equality is being broken. So underneath what happens in our schools, is also what we are about as a democracy. How do we live? And how do we negotiate with each other? We do have different values. We do have different interests, individuals as well as groups. And we resolve those issues by not killing each other, by not punching lumps out of each other. You know, as a head teacher, I used to spend a lot of time standing in my office speaking to two wee kids who were in conflict with each other and asking them, well, how are we going to resolve this? And part of living in a school community is about learning about that process where you're living in a democracy and you're not, you know, fighting each other all the time. You're not the most powerful wins and the least powerful loses. You're trying to find some basis for agreeing with each other, finding the common ground and finding a process that helps you to agree with each other. And I think these democratic values go right through every aspect of our schooling and particularly, I want to return to this equality of value. But it's a difficult thing to do in a secondary school and much easier in a primary school setting because in a secondary school, the system values children differently. In fact, that's one of the whole points of the system. We select them and sort them and grade them and rank them for what they're going to go on to next. And our language is full of the language of differentiation, of unequal value. I mean, what does higher say if not that everything else is lower? So our whole education system is shot through with that imposition of an inequality on a people that we at the same time say are equally valuable. I mean, going back to our religious tradition, everybody was equally valuable before God. And in our democratic tradition, every citizen has equal value. And yet our school system says, you know what, the most important thing actually is how we can separate you out and value you differently. 
So we are constantly called in our schools, in secondary schools, to match that tension, to balance that tension. And it's no different to the tension between liberty and equality in our democracy. It's a tension that's there all the time. And it has to be negotiated and balanced in the day-to-day -day interactions we have with our pupils in our schools. And the way that you all do that, I'm quite sure, I tried to do that, and teachers over the years have tried to do that, is by personal relationships. OK, we know you're not in top class, or we know you're only going for National 4 and they're going for National 5, but all the same, we still think you're just as good as people, as pupils. We still value you. Now, you can get away with that for a bit, but with some pupils, they don't accept that. They think the system, the school system, doesn't value them. And of course they don't, therefore, respond terribly well in school. And I'm sure you know quite a few of them as well. Um, we live in an unequal society and we're preparing these children for unequal outcomes with unequal salaries and unequal paths in life. To pretend otherwise is really quite silly. So we're trying to value children equally while at the same time valuing them differently. And that's two horses that are quite difficult to ride at the same time. And I pay tribute to all of you because in your daily struggles in school, that's quite often at its root what you are doing. So I'm going to finish with just a wee word or two from my 40 years as to what I think we should be doing next. And by the way, this is not my suggestion for another top-down imposition, um, nor is it my suggestion for anybody that doesn't want to take it up. In fact, I think the best way to introduce new things is to find the enthusiasts. And if it's a good idea, give them a bit of money and let them get on with it and let them sort it out. After all, that's what we did a wee bit at standard grade, didn't we, when we introduced standard grade in the 80s. And, you know, National 4 and National 5 were kind of introduced, you know, you know what, the whole country is going to do this overnight, no matter who you are, no matter whether you've got two people off in your department, long term, one maternity leave, one is ill, it doesn't matter who you are, what your situation is, you're going to go in the same year as everybody else. It didn't, didn't work. It's not surprising it didn't work. Standard grade, we had piloting, we had evaluation of the pilots, we amended it. There was a whole lot of preparation for change. And to change things on a big scale, you need time. Now, my suggestion, um, and it's written up in this book, the Schooling Scotland book, and it was taken up by the Labour Party in the last election, the Scottish Labour Party, by Ian Gray at the, in Manifesto. But of course, they didn't get on very well, so it didn't get anywhere. Um, uh, and it's not a rehashed, by the way, those of you who are around in TVI days, this is not a rehashed record of achievement. My idea was to introduce what I called a graduation certificate for all 18-year-olds in Scotland. It's a commonly understood concept, a graduation certificate. You've reached the end of one stage and now you're ready to go on to the next stage. Open to all children, every young person at age 18, whether they're still in school or whether they're pursuing their education through job training or in a college or in some other setting. And I think that's quite an important equalisation, that all children should be in education, all young people, until they're 18, wherever the setting. Because at the moment, there's quite a lot of our young people leave school at 16 and we don't know whether they're getting any more education or not, quite frankly. And they might be in a positive destination, as we found out recently, that actually is a zero hours contract. So having that guarantee is an important equal value, I think, to say to all young people, no matter what situation you're in, whether you're in school or not, you're still in education and you still can be ambitious enough to want to graduate. So that graduation certificate should include examination results and they should be graded. That's an important function of examinations to, so that we can decide who's going to operate us on us when we're in our 70s and we need somebody to do some restorative surgery. We don't want somebody that didn't pass their hires, that's for sure. So we still need that. But life in a democracy is about so much more than that. And the diversity of people and what they contribute is so much more valuable than that. There's so many other things that young people learn from and learn with in society beyond school and within school in the way that they conduct themselves within the school community, a whole range of ways. And I've made some suggestions in the book as to what some of these categories could be, such as voluntary activity in the community. And these are the kinds of things that 
would reward the breadth of a person as he or she steps from secondary beyond and into adult life. I don't think we've got the system well designed at the moment. I think it's quite badly designed and I think you have to make it work as we had to make it work you know, back when raising of the school leaving age came in in 1972, that was a big thing when I first started as a teacher. Um, you know, it was, you know what, everybody's going to stay on till 16. Oh, what are we going to do with them? Well, I've no idea. That was the challenge then. Then it was standard grade. Then it was higher still. Now it's national fours, national fives are the biggest issue on the table. So we have to make it work. We know we're just going to have to get on and do it. And by and large, we've done it and you will do it, but it doesn't mean it's a well-designed system. And, you know, just my final thought, um, we're very good nationally because the, the politicians and the national people, they get all the air time. They're the people that get the media time. They're the people that, as Walter Humans would say, dictate the narrative. They put the words out there that determine what the debate is about. And their narrative is, We've got great policies, it's just the teachers aren't able to quite implement them. Whereas actually the narrative is, um, you know what, the policies aren't terribly well designed and the teachers are making them work really well despite the fact that they're not well designed. And that's... <laughs> that is a narrative that needs to have a stronger voice. So lastly, as a lifetime member of the EIS. <laughs> I just want to I just want to say what a pleasure it has been to attend this conference. And I really do respect and always did respect the work that the SSTA does in Scottish education. I don't think it should be the only voice in Scottish education. I think we're better for having more than one voice that can represent different perspectives so that we collectively, as a profession, can come closer to the truth. Because one thing's for sure, if you're only listening to your own voice, you will never hear the truth. You need to listen to other people. Thank you very much for offering me this opportunity, and thank you for allowing me to attend your conference. I wish you all the best. That Danny's very, uh, very kindly agreed to take any questions that we may have. If you do have a question, if you can maybe just raise your hand and there is a roving microphone somewhere in the room. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, this would be the time to ask them. Nobody ever wants to be the first, do they? <laughs> I'll look around to see. Certainly, uh, Seamus would like to ask a question. You've got a microphone. Oh, you go, use that one. Uh, uh, thank you very much for yeah, your, your presentation. Uh, could I just ask one question? I mean, I, I did ask originally about what you saw the future. Uh, I mean, I'll ask you probably and whether you want to answer it is about uh, where do you see the governance review going? Mm. Well, thanks, Seamus. Uh, obviously, we're all waiting with bated breath. Having, you know, I think John Swinney took on something that was bigger than he expected. I don't know, really, because he thought he was going to... Originally, it was meant to be Easter, wasn't it? He was going to tell us what his conclusions were now it's August. I wouldn't be surprised if when it gets to August it will be December uh, because it is a massive topic. I mean, I think it's, again, it's an under-designed approach. So we know that there's difficulties with local government in Scotland. The Forsyth Review, uh, which led to our 32 current councils, was set up on the wrong basis. You know, there was a gerrymandering of councils. We had East Renfrewshire, you know, Stirling and Clackmannanshire. I worked in Clackmannanshire, the smallest council. You know, inevitably that council reform didn't really work. But we know that um, national government at the moment isn't terribly interested in local government reform because it deflects attention from the Scottish agenda. So we've now got this kind of piecemeal bits and piecey thing. You know, we've got... A quango, 13 or 14 quangos organising our health service. We now have 13 or 14 quangos organising our college, colleges of education, and we've got 32 local authorities. Uh, so we've got two unaccountable de semi-democratic bodies running our big services of further education and health. 
and we've got 32 small elected authorities running our secondary education, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think picking at one little bit of the system, to me, doesn't make any sense. So when I responded to them, I pretty much said that. And I said, you know what, as a former head teacher, I can anticipate whatever comes out of it, if it is these joint boards, it's going to be having me going out of school even more to attend these women joint board meetings and persuade a new set of people, actually, you know what, it's not about what's happening out here, it's about what's happening in the school, that's where it actually happens. Um, because the head teacher often is the bridge between the people at the centre and the people in the school and has a quite a powerful, or can have, a powerful voice. So I see potentially a lot of wasted time as well with the new layer of bureaucracy. On the other hand, give the guy a chance. You know, John Swinney is a sensible character. I think that's maybe why he's taking a bit more time about it. So let's wait and see. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Yes, uh, Stuart Hunter here at the front. Uh, Mr. Glenn is coming in at great, great speed. <laughs> <laughs> Careful there. Thank you for, for your talk, Ashley. I found it really enjoyable. Um, really what I was thinking about is that when you spoke about the core democratic values and how important that is in your time uh, through education, I'm also thinking about the, the OECD and when we compare the core demographic uh, values that you described in education and concerning the OECD, which is subscribed to by a significant number of countries, and it's that economic factor that's driving, how do you think the two square, if they do need to square together with the values and the vision of the OECD? Yeah, I think that's a very good question, and it goes to the heart of our problems politically as well as educationally. Um, you know, I would say, you know, we live in a more material society now than when I was growing up. Uh, it's a more individualised society, a more fragmented society where there are less values of cohesion and community. And that replicates to some extent the competitiveness of the international economic order, which is pretty ruthless. You know, multinationals will move their businesses from one country to another and com countries end up playing catch up with each other, you know, the kind of race to the bottom idea. You know, Ireland's got lower corporation tax than the UK because it can bring in businesses to Ireland. So all of that stuff is going on in the background. And it's really important to keep an educational voice somewhere in there and to hold to those basic educational values. And that is our job. You don't get the chance to say it as individuals, because as individual teachers or individual head teachers, we're muzzled to some extent on the extent to which we can say these kinds of things. Uh, but you can say it through your professional association, and you do say it. I was really impressed with what you and had to say this morning. I felt it was a really inspiring and uplifting speech on behalf of the profession. So we just have to hold to our professional values, as the, as the medical professionals do. They're in the same position. You know, they're in exactly the same position in the medical profession where the, there's this enormous expectation top down from politicians and an enormous build up of expectation from the voters. And the narrative of elections is completely about the economics and not about other things. I mean, to me, for example, the European referendum was much more about peace and security in Europe. You know, for the first 60-odd years in human history, Europe has been, by and large, at peace. And bits that weren't at peace, like the Balkans, we've brought them in and made them at peace. What a fantastic achievement. When was that ever talked about in the referendum debates? Mm -hmm. So we as educators have to raise our eyes beyond the economics, I think, believe in ourselves, believe in each other, support each other, that it's not just about the economics. Of course, the economics is important, but there's other things that are important too. That's my view. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we've got time for one more question, if uh, anybody's got any, anything they were, they were burning to ask. Yes, we've got one over here. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question about, the, you say that politics are delivering the narrative. Don't you think the political parties, instead of bitching at each other, should get together, sit down, and work out totally amongst all parties and all governments 
how the education system should go forward. Yeah, if only. <laughs> yeah, I quite agree. Um, in fact, I think that's not a bad model for politics. I mean, we have an adversarial system in the UK, so it's always about sniping at the other people and not about how can we work on this together. Um, and to a certain extent, that's the case in Europe as well. I know that. And even here in Scotland, where we designed a proportional representation to almost force parties to work together, you know, we can't stop ourselves not wanting to work together. So we're even going to the extent of uh, dismissing people from our party if they want to work together with somebody else, uh, which we've seen this week. So, yeah, our politics doesn't help us, I don't think, with big public services like education. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much tension between the public professionals who do the job and who have expertise and the politicians who have probably never done the job um, but need to find some way of fixing what they think is wrong. So, no, I agree with you. If only we could build, build a consensus together rather than finding each other's weaknesses. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, maybe one final round of applause, please, for our speaker. Thank you. And just before you go...